Uh, so welcome and congratulations for making it to the last session almost of the <laughs> this long conference. So uh, this is going to be a session about WPE, about building yeah, and user applications for embedded devices and products. Uh, some of you, of you, I know you are already familiar with WP, um, but still I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a, a, an introduction a bit about everything because we don't know who is listening also on the other side. So first about me, uh, I'm Mario, I'm a computer science engineer, I'm partner of Igalia as well. Uh, we've been presenting a few talks here in this conference, so you might be familiar already with this, with this company. Uh, I've been involved in open source for a, for a long while already. Uh, in, in GNOME, initially, I also worked for several years on WebKit, uh, uh, mostly around the accessibility stack and the WebKit GTK port. Uh, I've been also working on Chromium, and even if it's not mentioned here, uh, it'll be in, I've been done also a fair chunk of work on Linux-based operating systems, in particular with uh, one operating system called Landless, in case you're familiar with. Um, yeah, and I also, if you're familiar with the time on MyEmo, I also did my fair bit there, and Samsung as uh, the smart TV platform. Uh, these days, I'm sadly not doing anything all that anymore. I'm coordinating Igalia's WebKit team. So that's why this, this session is going to be uh, less technical than other sessions like the one that my colleague Adrian gave yesterday. Uh, so about Igalia, in case you're not familiar well, just a quick recap, we are an open source consultancy uh, founded in Spain uh, 23 years ago in the northwest of Spain, a region called Galicia. We have the headquarters in there, uh, but we are actually fully remote right now. We are 140 people uh, distributed in 20 something countries around the world. And we follow an unusual structure. We are uh, operate a flat structure where basically everyone is eventually meant to become a partner of the company. So it's quite unusual. And we made decisions on a consensus based mechanism. Uh, we've been top contributors to the main web rendering engines for a while already, like started with WebKit, but then also Chromium and Gecko. And most recently, we took over the maintenance of Servo from, from Mozilla. Um, if you came to our booth, you might be familiar with these concepts as well. Uh, but we also work on other um, open source projects as well, like uh, JavaScript engines, uh, compilers, um, even Node.js or the multimedia stack like GitStreamer or the, the MESA and the Linux kernel, yeah. We, because of this, we are also members of different working groups, um, like the W3C and the WG are the obvious ones, but then also TC39 for our working in JavaScript and well, Chronos for graphics, uh, several ones. So this talk, like I said, is not going to be deeply technical. Um, so this is an outline I was going to, was going to be about. So it's going to be a quick introduction to web rendering engines and in particular WebKit, and then going deeper into WP in particular, and then um, give a, a bunch of ideas and general ideas about uh, what is important to take into account when integrating WP in a product if you want to build. So um, web rendering engines, I will probably be calling them web engines randomly, so that's why I make this clarification. So what is a web rendering engine? So I think the, the easiest description I can think of is just, you know, it's a software component that basically allows you to uh, use the power of the web platform uh, to develop your products. So basically develop your projects with web-based uh, technology like HTML, JavaScript, CSS. I think you, most of you are familiar with all that. So uh, step by step, what it does a web engine, like again, very high level is, it fetches the information from the network from the multiple sources like the document and all the different resources linked from the document. Uh, it then interprets all that web content and creates these internal representations uh, to process them later on. Like in the case of WebKit and Chromium, it's basically a forest of trees. Uh, basically just initially like uh, it has to determine first the tree of, of the different nodes, which is the DOM tree. And then with that, it has to real, uh, figure out which of those nodes will, re will uh, be represented by visual nodes. In, in that's a different tree, it's called the render tree. Uh, then with that, it has also to take into account all the CSS rules and all different kind of things and, and do a process that is called real layout, which is basically position everything in every different place. And then with that, it even creates a different tree, which is called a render layer tree, <laughs> which is very, off, very useful in embedded devices because it's what allows you hardware acceleration by putting things in layers, sending them to the GPU so that it can be composited. And then eventually, you know, 
does the rasterization step and things go out into the display. So, yeah, and then, and I'm not even talking about other trees like the accessibility tree, so it's, it's really a forest of trees. Uh, with that, uh, WebKit, well, WebKit, sorry, a web engine produces a result, and this result, the whole point is that the user can interact with. So, mm, most of the times people are thinking of something visual, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, but this is the whole point. Like you produce something that you will interact with in, in, on a screen or via uh, voice commands or, or whatever you can think of. So it's an extremely flexible platform. Um, and I, like I was anticipating already, uh, it's useful for textual and non-textual content, but uh, even if you just want to leverage the, 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 the web platform to say, play some audio and you don't need a display, you can use it for that too. No, nothing, it's nothing that says that you have to use it to, to render visually something on a screen. Um, and then, well, and these days mostly it's also used besides web browsers for developing uh, fully fledged applications in, in specific contexts like in in-flight vehicle, in-flight entertainment, um, GPSs and well, many cases. So a distinction that I usually make, uh, if you're familiar with that, forbid, forgive me, but uh, I usually have to make this distinction. A web engine is not a web browser. It's a different thing. Uh, and in the case of other web engines, like what the, the one that is using Chromium, it becomes a bit more confusing because people do embed Chromium. But in the case of WebKit, which is what we are, talk, talk to be a, where we are going to be talking about, it's an important distinction. The, the web browser is what you build with a web engine, but the web engine is the component that does all that. It's not, the web engine is not the address bar or the back and forward buttons or that, or, and nothing like that. It's just the component. And these days, the most popular web engines are um, the one WebKit, which is the, this, this, the icon on the, on the top left. Uh, then Blink, I, I'm afraid there is no icon for Blink, so I put the icon for Chromium. So Blink is the web engine that is in Chromium. Gecko, which is the web engine used by Firefox, and Servo, which is uh, this other web engine that is written in Rust and that, like I said before, we took over from the Mozilla Foundation. So what is WebKit? Uh, it's an open source web rendering engine. Uh, these days, uh, maybe it's not that relevant to say open source because most of them, or at least most of the relevant ones are, but back in the day, it was not the case. We have uh, Presto for Opera and Trident for Internet Explorer, so it's still a relevant thing to, to mention. Uh, it started as a fork of KHTML and KJS in the 2001, uh, which were the web rendering engine and JavaScript engines used in KDE for the Conqueror browser, if you're familiar with it. Um, back in the day, uh, WebKit was used mainly for Apple, but then Google also joined because it was used as the basis of Chromium, the Chromium browser as well. And then in 2013, uh, it, it got forked um, by Chromium and renamed into Blink for the case of Chromium. Uh, before, exactly before this point, WebKit actually had an architecture that even allowed two different JavaScript engines, V8 and JavaScript Core. But after this point, that was cleaned up, and now WebKit only uses JavaScript Core, just for reference. Um, so the main goals uh, haven't changed, has been in the, in the website <laughs> for a while. Are, for WebKit are basically these ones, like performance. Uh, it's, it's really important, and there is a very strict policy with zero tolerance for performance regressions in WebKit, so there's no way you, you will be landing a patch if the performance bots detect uh, that there is a regression there. Portability has to be working in many different platforms, not just operating systems, uh, different, different devices. Uh, stability and compatibility is obviously a must. Standard compliance is meant to be a, a, a web engine that is compatible with the whole web platform, not just a subset. So it's very important also that uh, it's interoperable with other web engines. Security is a big thing in WebKit. I, I will say in all web engines. WebKit's been always like a, one of the main things. Hackability, this is a weird term, but it refers to the fact that uh, it should be, it should be, I don't know if pleasant is the word, but it, it should be easy to get hacking into it. I mean, as, as easy as it can get to hack into a 26 million uh, code base, lines of code base, but it shouldn't be that much of a pain either. Uh, and then, and I will insist, embeddability. And this is one of the main distinctions between WebKit and, for instance, the Blink, which is using Chromium. And I will get into this uh, in the next slide. And like I said, because of the portability, it's important that it's supported in different platforms. So that means desktop and mobile. Uh, back in the day, uh, it was used in many more use cases, of course, because Chromium was also used in many cases. But even to this day, it's not just used in, in Safari, uh, as many people <laughs> sometimes think. Uh, but in embedded, for instance, um, there's a lot of 
places where MWAKIT is being used in set-top boxes is, is, is counted in the, in the hundreds of millions of deployments these days. Uh, video game consoles as well, like the PlayStation, uh, smart home appliances, like if you're familiar with the Thermomix, for instance, the cooking machine, yes, uh, when you cook, you're using WebKit. Um, and then in vehicle in-flight entertainment, uh, GPS devices, digital signage as well, uh, this is a really common use case where you have a big display just in, in shopping malls or in airports. Um, that's one of the other things. So a few advantages of WebKit. Uh, um, one of them is, it is, as I said before, it's a complete implementation of the web platform. This is relevant because there are other web engines that are not. Uh, like uh, these days, for instance, Servo is a, is a very good use case. Uh, it's based on Rust and it's very secure, but right now it's not uh, yet a complete implementation as WebKit. WebKit is basically at, at the same level than, than Blink for Chromium. The other thing is this one, it's embeddable as a top priority, and now I will insist even more. Uh, this is extremely important because in WebKit, the, the web engine, this component, is the, is the actual product. So the whole point of WebKit is that you are going to be able to use the web platform in, in your application, in your product, uh, regardless of what that product is. So for that to be able to happen, uh, you have to have one thing that is mandatory, so a, sta a stable, a clear and a stable API, public API. This cannot change, it cannot be broken across releases because that's the product. The idea is that you should be able to put this, um, this component in your product, build your project on, on top of that, and then uh, be able to update to new versions of WebKit without breaking your product. Um, this, is, um, this is a big difference back in the day uh, when, when we started working on WebKit Gecko was also the same thing. You could use Gecko to build your, your browser, but uh, eventually, I think it was 2010, uh, there was this decision that Gecko would not longer be like that. The Mozilla would be able to break the API anytime they wanted because Gecko was just meant to be used by Firefox. So as you can imagine, if you base your product that is not Firefox on Gecko, that was a pain to maintain. So WebKit, on that point of view, was really useful because it guarantees the API will be stable. So this, uh, this is also means that it's self-contained, so you won't have uh, anything outside of WebKit that you will need to be running WebKit. So it's, it's, it's really good on that point of view. Uh, it has a flexible and modular architecture, which also is what allows us to, allow us in Igalia to create this product, uh, WP. Uh, the, the fact that WebKit is self-contained, but at the same time it has a very clear architecture for uh, that separates clearly the, the platform independent code and all those abstractions from the platform specific uh, layers um, and you can adapt to different platforms. So it's, that makes it, uh, I won't say easy, but it makes it feasible to be able to develop a product like WGP that I will get more into detail. Well, like I say, privacy and security is, is, uh, is our big concerns in WebKit. So this has been a motto since the beginning. So it, yeah, it's an advantage, I guess, against other web engines that are not as secure. But I'm not, not, don't get me wrong, this is not a comparison against Chromium, in case you wonder. It's just advantages that you get by, by choosing WebKit. Uh, performance and stability, like I said before, I won't insist more on that. And this last one, uh, I also think it's a, it's a very important one, it's, it's an in the, in all the Linux-based flavors are independent, meaning that they are not controlled by any big corporation. So this means that if you have, um, and it is combined with the fact that this is an open source project, means that if you want to develop a product based on a web engine uh, and on a Linux-based device, and you, you, you have a much, um, it's much easier for you to, to push things upstream that are on your interest. Uh, you don't have to fight against the, the interest of one or two single big corporations that might not want to, that might, might not find it interesting to get your, your changes applied. So in this case, it's, uh, it's, an independent, it's an independent web engine. So the architecture 101, uh, really simple, like you have your application at the top, which is what you are building, and then you just go against this clean and stable public API, which is uh, this thin layer that we call, inside of the whole WebKit thing, there is this layer at top that is what we call the WebKit API. Is all you need. Uh, underneath that, there is all the chunk of all the other 20 something million lines of code, <laughs> which is uh, WebCore is the part that is platform independent and is the part that implements all these algorithms for fetching, for uh, parsing the, the DOM tree, parsing the CSS rules, creating these trees that I mentioned before, all that without assuming any specific platform. 
Uh, and then uh, when it comes to putting that into actual pixels or, or you know, um, fetching the bits from the network using a specific library, then is when you have to implement these platform-specific hooks in what we call the platform layer. But this is quite separated from the web core part. And then on the side, there is the JavaScript engine, which is called JavaScript core. Back in the day, you could choose this one or V8, but that's been, it's been 11 years since you cannot do that anymore. And with that in mind, uh, the description, the other obvious description before getting into WP is a WebKit port, which is a WebKit port. Uh, it is uh, an adaptation of, of the WebKit engine to a specific platform. So basically, what I, in the picture before, if you, if you take that, that box at the bottom and you make it a specific for the, the library that you need on your target platform, that's what basically makes a port along with, with, the other, with all the rest of WebKit. These days, there are a bunch of official WebKit ports. So the, the ones for Mac and iOS, those are the ones that Apple maintain uh, for the obvious, the, the usual suspects, Safari, Apple Mail, iTunes, uh, and same thing for the iOS. There is the Win Cairo port, which uh, is for Windows. And this is a port that is mostly used these days as a component for the PlayStation SDK by Sony developers. Uh, and it's maintained by them, actually. And then there is the PlayStation, the PlayStation port. Uh, which is on the PlayStation 4, and this S4 is, is a typo. It's PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5. And then there are the last two, which are Wacky GTK and WP, uh, which are the ones used in, in Linux environments. Uh, Wacky GTK more in the desktop, and WP on embedded devices. So these two ones in particular uh, are not just, in, they don't have only in common that they are uh, for Linux based system, but Actually, they have a lot of shared libraries and shared paths. And actually, the WP port started kind of started as taking WebKit GTK and removing the GTK out of it and, and simplifying it so that it could be used in, in embedded environments uh, with more constrained um, requirements. So the common parts, like all these libraries, like Glib, which is a library for the, all the basic functionality that you would expect from a, from, from a C library, or from a, from a C-based environment. Libsub for networking, those are shared. Uh, GStreamer for multimedia, they share that as well. Uh, it's not mentioned here, but in the previous version of WebKitGTK, uh, ATK for accessibility as well. ATK is not used anymore for, for, for newer versions of WebKit and GTK, but uh, when it was used, it was common parts. But there are key differences, and the main difference is on, it is on the input and the output. So on WebKit GTK, uh, it assumes the GTK toolkit. And actually, if you are familiar with GTK, what it does, what it gives you is a, is a widget. It's a GTK widget that is the web view that you can embed in your application and, and you are set. Uh, well, you're set. You, you get a component, then you can interact with it through different APIs. But basically, you get a widget that you can add to your, to your window. Um, and then the input handling. In the, in the desktop, you, you expect to use it like with a mouse and, and, a, and a keyboard. Uh, in embedded, it depends. So in the case of uh, WP, that's abstracted to, to backends. I will get into that later. So Wake GTK is, these days is considered the go-to solution for, for embedding web content on GTK applications on a desktop, uh, and also integrates really well with GNOME uh, by supporting GTK3 and GTK4. Uh, well, but in WP, instead, is yeah, much lower level and aim at embedded devices and requires that you specify uh, what graphic and input backend you, you want to use. So taking the, the, just to finish this section, taking the diagram from before, if this is the generic WebKit uh, thing with all these layers, uh, when you change those bosses, that's what makes a GTK port, right? You, you provide the platform specific hooks, so uh, Libsub, Cairo, GStreamer for, for in this case, for network, 2D rendering, and multimedia. Uh, also, the API layer is specific to WebKit GTK because it provides a GTK widget. In WP, is different. And then you have a GTK application. So that's what makes a port. So with that out of, of the way, um, so what is WP? It's a port <laughs> optimized for embedded devices based on Linux. So it's a... Uh, some, some interesting thing about, about this is it provides you with a fully operational JavaScript engine. Uh, it's fully operational on, on, and supports 64-bit arch architectures. And also, um, is maintained for 32-bit as well. Uh, only that in 32-bit, you don't have all the optimizations that you have available in 64. But 
on just basic ones, but it's still guaranteed to work and we are maintaining that. Uh, and there is also some initial support for RISC-5, but uh, I don't think we can get onto that now. Then the second, the second point is that, um, yeah, uh, besides the focus on security and performance that is general from WebKit, uh, WP is very focused on being flexible because you don't know what kind of device you are going to, to work on. You don't know what kind of hardware you're going to have to work with. Uh, and that basically determines also your input and your output. So in order to work uh, like that, it has to be very flexible. And that's why, uh, it support, first of all, it, we did try really hard to reduce the amount of dependencies to the bare minimum. That's one thing, so that you don't need to put uh, n too much stuff on your device. And the second thing is that we designed it with a backend-based architecture so that you, you can plug mm, different components depending on the input and output you want to use. We provide already uh, some default backends so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. But that nothing really prevents you from adapting in, in that backend to your needs or even creating a, a custom backend. It's something that we've done a few times already in the past. Um, the other point is that we have a big focus on low memory and low storage footprint uh, for obvious reasons, like because when you have devices like the, the Raspberry Pi 3 or, or an IMX 6 board, things like that, you, need, you really need, cannot count on having gigs of memory or, and really a lot of processing power. So that's another big focus on, on WGP. Um, and finally, we also support hardware acceleration, graphics and multimedia. Uh, we do big efforts on that as well because we understand that as much as we can relieve the CPU for doing work, that's going to be always going to be for the better. Unfortunately, not every single board we can do that because not every board supports uh, the APIs that we need. But whenever those APIs are available, we try hard to use them. Like I guess a good example is most recently in the last couple of years, we implemented support for DMA buff that is being like uh, crucial in, in, in terms of avoiding, um, you know, extra copies, not just for, for, for graphics, for communicating with the GPU, but even on the multimedia pipeline, we use DMA buff as well for passing things between the different steps of the multimedia pipeline and avoiding copies as much as possible. And what is not WP, and I like to insist on this as well, it's not a general, it's not a general web browser. It's just that component and it's not meant to be. So it just gives you the building box, but as you cannot expect uh, to build WP and then have, not even, you don't even have a launcher or you, you need something else to put, you know, the web content on the screen and be able to interact with it. This just provides you with the building blocks. Uh, it doesn't implement all the APIs. Uh, what this means is that in embedded environments might not make sense to, to have all the APIs that you have available in a desktop browser implemented. So basically we are implementing them uh, in case uh, whenever we have a, a need or we detect a need, they are implemented. But there are some APIs. I think a good example is, is the pointer lock API that uh, it hasn't been implemented for a while. I don't know, is it implemented already, Adrian? But it's been recent, right? Last three months, that, there you go. So the pointer lock API, if you are familiar with it, is, uh, if you're not familiar with it, is what is used in, in games, for instance, in games like shooters, where you, you, don't, you are playing, you don't want the cursor to be messing around, you want to use the mouse to you know, change your view. So you need to lock the pointer. Uh, and that was not a need uh, until recently for, because on embedded on a set-top box might not be the, the, the use case that you, you wanted to do, but it's being detected as a need recently and it's being implemented. But there are, might be other APIs that are not implemented, but there's still a lot of coverage. It doesn't rely on any particular toolkit. This is by design. Like I said, you don't get a widget. You don't get nothing like that. You get just a, a component that allows you to, to, to render some content into a display where you want to put it and also allows you to interact with it. And because of this uh, unconventional approach, it can also be useful for less conventional use cases like server-side rendering, uh, where you, I don't know, you, maybe you get a, a video feed and you want to overlay some, something on top and then the result, uh, ship it to some, some, from that server to some other device and you do that on the server, that you can do that. Headless mode, you might have an audio system a hi-fi system where you just want to use WP to consume uh, a multimedia endpoint for, from, a, from a streaming service to put, to get, just to get the sound and put it through the speakers and you don't need a display. So it's very convenient for that. So the architecture uh, of WP uh, is basically 
obviously is what I, kind of what I showed before, just with a twist, is you get the application, you get the web kit port, but you also get these backends in the middle, which are the platform specification, specific implementation for, for how you want to use the, in the, the output and the input layers. So with this, um, going through the components of WP, so I th there are three main components, COC, uh, oh, sorry, uh, four, if you want to consider also uh, the final step that you need. So the first one is what we call WP WebKit. This is the actual WebKit port. It's, uh, technically speaking, this is the, the WP WebKit port. That is actually, the code is in the upstream WebKit repository. Um, it relies on the backends for page display and, and input. Um, I can say there. And, and, but how you do get the display rendered on the screen and how you deal with the input, you, you, you need to abstract something like that. So you have this other component, LeadWP. What it provides is you, it's just the glue between the port and the backends. So it gives you uh, rendering related call, call, callbacks that are, that are called from the WP port and are implemented by the actual gra back, graphical backends. And it also provides you, it gives you a, a, a way uh, for the input backend to rely events from the from the application to the WebKit port, and the other and the other the other component that we ship is the WP backend FDO, which is a backend uh, using free desktop uh, technologies so like Wayland, for instance. Uh, finally, you need a launcher. So we also provide this launcher that is called Coq, uh, which is basically uh, it's a small. It provides you with a small window. Uh, doesn't have user interface, just render the, render, the, render the content, the web content, but you also can interact with it uh, if you want through the bus with a COG CTL command line uh, tool that we also provide. But it doesn't provide you with an address bar or a back and forward, basically just a place where you, you get everything rendered in a Wayland environment. So some examples of use cases that we are aware about, uh, set of boxes, smart home appliances. I think most of them I already mentioned them, so I, I think I will skip. And the last one, QI and testing, uh, is also used in headless mode, for instance, by the Playwright uh, testing automation system, uh, basically to make sure that, uh, to, to be able to, to run your test in different, in different, for different engines, Chromium, Firefox, and, and WebKit, and in the case of WebKit, uh, some of the tests are used running WP because it allows this headless mode. So, yeah, uh, well, I have here a demo. If you've, been, if you've been in the booth, you've already seen this one. So this one shows um, a bunch of WebGL examples that are running on a Raspberry Pi 3 board. So these, these are fairly old demos, but um, they're still good to showcase how it enables uh, lower power devices, right, with, uh, to run complex WebGL applications. So the point is that the CPU remains low uh, all the time uh, and while having a decent rate of FPS, a decent rate for a Raspberry Pi 3. And obviously, if you get a Raspberry Pi 4 or 5, it goes faster, but the whole point is that it allows you hardware acceleration. And the second demo, this one is, um, is showing WPE playing HD video and applying different transformations, like uh, uh, splitting the image, uh, doing translations, uh, scaling, all those kind of things in real time, uh, sustaining again a decent, a decent rate of FPS. This is a fairly old, but I, I keep showing it because the, the device is so constrained that it still amazes me that it works. Um, and this is a version, a really old version of WP. These days it's even more performant. So if you want to integrate all these things in your project, what are the things that um, need to be taken into account. I had a much uh, bigger description, but Adrian just did an amazing job in his talk that I recommend you to watch uh, in more detail on what exactly uh, to do. So if you are looking into a more detailed, more deep uh, down description, I recommend you to watch that talk. But basically it all boils down to, to a few steps, higher level. Like first one, you carefully choose your hardware. Sometimes you cannot choose it freely, but as much as you can, um, um, this is probably one of the most important steps. So you need to determine the, the specifics, the characteristics of the hardware you are going to be relying on. And be aware that uh, different hardware have different constraints. Uh, so it might impose different restrictions. Like, I don't know, you might, uh, we know for a fact that there are certain boards that uh, don't allow, for instance, a um, tiled uh, direct scan out, and you have to put everything on a linear direct scan out that basically prevents you from running certain optimizations. So, um, the, if, you, if you have a choice and you can choose a hardware that is better suited for your, for your product, that's better. If not, WP can adapt. 
The second one is to determine the input devices you want to use. Uh, this is basically how your users are going to interact with your product. So it's, it's another important thing as well. Uh, and it's also what is going to determine what kind of backends you are going to need. Exactly the same thing for the output devices. So determine what kind of, of displays. Uh, most of the time people are thinking always on HD or full HD or 4K screens, but with standard resolutions, but you can, all go, you can also be using LED displays with random aspect ratios, uh, which is very common, for instance, for digital signets. And th those things also impose certain restrictions. Or uh, like Adrian mentioned yesterday, a specific rotations that you might need to, to run because the, the display is not arranged as you would expect. And once you have all that information, the other thing is figure out whether you need custom backends you can, or you can use the ones that are already available. The second part is to assemble the, the required components. So the first one, the first obvious ones is the, you need the WP libraries. Um, the current API has three components, as we saw before, the WP WebKit, which is the port, the libwp component, which is this glue between that and the backends, and then the backends. Right now, we are working on a new API. Um, this is not an announcement, so don't quote me on that, but we are working on this, and the idea is to have it ready as soon as possible. We hope it will be ready soon. <laughs> I don't, want to, I don't want to say anything, uh, but it's, it's moving very fast. And the whole idea with this new API is to make it even simpler because we detected that the, all this flexibility with WP work, WP, and all the backends is great, but it also imposes certain complexity to work with WP and that we are aware of it. Uh, so the new API aims to simplify that much more. So to, ideally, you only have to worry about uh, w, the, the WP WebKit uh, component and this WP platform that you are going to get also it's going to be treated as one thing and you don't have to worry in many cases not even about the backends so that WP platform will be able even to automatically select them. Um, then they, obviously you need to provide a rootfs image that has all the dependencies for, for 2D rendering, for multimedia, for networking, for all the usual stuff. Uh, it's very important to have support for OpenGL and, and EGL as well. And then, obviously, any other library that, that you might need for, for your purposes. Uh, at the same time, you also need uh, to have a launcher application. Uh, you can use COG, that is, by the way, is using the old API, or you can just roll out your own, your own application. Uh, and rolling out a new, uh, your own application uh, at a very basic level uh, with the new API is as simple as this. Uh, it's basically just, this is a, a simple example. Uh, I think you also showed it yesterday. So just to walk through it, it basically creates a, a main loop, creates a, a web view, we pass null, which means in the new API, it means that uh, you are letting WP select the right backend automatically, and just loads this, this URL, and that's it, and it will run the main loop. As simple as, simple as it gets. And then once you have all that, you basically have to, well, you have to do your job, <laughs> and develop your project. Um, you, the nice thing is that because it's a web environment, you can also prototype and write it m most often, even on your desktop machine, and then you, you can, obviously, you have to test it on the, on the target board, target platform, but uh, this is the other nice thing about uh, working with web-based technologies. As much as, as uh, it pains me to say this, I think we also need to be honest with ourselves. The devices that we are using most of the times are very constrained, so, um, I think if in some cases it might be important or it might be convenient to acknowledge that, that oh, my device is not particularly good with this particular type of operations, like a blur operation. So maybe, I mean, yeah, work it can be optimized, that's true, and we do everything we can. But in some cases, there might be also alternative ways of implementing your application. So if that's a, a possibility, we also recommend in, to be aware of those things. Because well, sometimes we, we find um, applications that are performing really bad, and it's not because uh, there is something fundamentally wrong with WebKit, but it's because the particular hardware is particularly bad on, on this very expensive blur operation. They, then we, we, we tell the, the customer, look, try this other operation. It's visually, it's going to be very similar, and then the performance gets, improves like a lot. So yeah, it's, a, it's basically a trade-off when you are working with embedded devices. Integrated with the rest of the platform, uh, this is again what you what you were mentioning yesterday as well. As well, the possibilities that uh, you get your web application, but you wanted to interact with the rest of the of the platform or your or your devices, and you can use all kind of things like a custom URI schemes. It's an option, or user script messages, or just JavaScript, plain JavaScript uh, APIs. 
that by the way you you can also implement your own in the in in WebKit if if you need them. And finally, testing and QA, uh, another very important thing. And in particular, these these platforms, these hardware platforms, uh, impose different restrictions. And testing automation is also very important for this. So we are also working now on improving the the web driver part of WebKit that should allow to get a much better uh, or pleasant way of implementing complex tests that are not with, with WebKit done before. Um, and finally, just bundle it up um, and ship it. Uh, you have a, a several ways of getting, of getting WPE from distribution packages to the source code, rough source code from the, from the, different, from the different repositories. Or if you are based on Jocto or build root, you can already use, uh, create your images based on the layers that we, we are providing. So for the case of Jocto, we actively maintain these ones. Uh, they are available on that, that link and it's the recommended way, but uh, build root, there is also support available. It's just not, we don't maintain that much, uh, as much as, as Jocto, so it's mostly on a, on a best effort basis. But they are there and you are always welcome to submit patches or, or, or report issues. And, and if you have some time after all this mess, uh, if you can collaborate <laughs> upstream, uh, that's always more than welcome because many times we, we don't know that a, that a problem is a problem until someone tells us. Uh, so, yeah. Um, there is some documentation, API documentation. Documentation is a, is a sore spot of WP. We are trying progressively to fix it. Uh, recently, we uploaded some documentation to the website uh, that was not there as of two weeks ago. Uh, and we plan to keep improving that one. Uh, but then there are also other useful links there, like the security advisory sort of mailing list. And that's pretty much it from my side. Like, they, just as a conclusion, uh, this is what I think I would like to communicate with this talk, that the web rendering engines are not just for building web browsers, as many of you already know. Um, that with WP, you can get all the strengths of the web platform, uh, but also adapt, adapted to embedded devices, thanks to this extra flexibility. Uh, that if you want to integrate WP in your product and you want to get an optimum result, uh, it's not just a matter of, of, of improving WP, which is also, or WebKit, which is also very important, but it's also a matter of being aware of choosing the right hardware um, and being aware of particular issues that you might have to avoid in your particular hardware. If, if you combine that with a ever uh, increase, ever, ever improving web engine, that should yield a, a really good product. Uh, and then, yeah, just develop your application, uh, know, knowing that uh, adaptations are always possible. Um, uh, and yeah, and the a last reminder that is fully open source, so contributions are more than welcome. Um, and that's it from my side. Uh, sorry, I think it took a bit longer than expected. Um, any questions or comments? Yeah. Cool. Uh, I saw you had like the video <clears throat> piece there. Do you know if there's anything with the WebKit to support making applications support like to H.265 codec or and output in like MPEG H, like more later standards, anything like that? Or where we could find resources on that? So yeah, um, yeah. Actually, it's a good point. I, I haven't insisted that much in this in this talk. Um, I mentioned very briefly about the multimedia support, but multimedia is actually a very big part of, of the WP port. Uh, in one of the main use cases, is the is the set of boxes. Oh my God! So many slides. Uh, <laughs> what is it? This thing. Yeah. Well, whatever. Um, one of the, the main use cases is, is set-top boxes where multimedia is, is, is very important. And because of the use cases that you have there, you have to support things like encrypted media extensions or media source extensions, all kind of DRM-based uh, playback uh, to be able to stream your favorite services. So yeah, there is a lot of support for that in WebKit. And you can also use different coders. You can use H.264, H.265, uh, VIV, v, V9. Uh, obviously, that depends on the platform that you have underneath and having the right driver for the particular uh, hardware that you have, but yeah. If I may add, uh, because we, re we rely on GStreamer for the multimedia operations, uh, if your platform happens to have uh, an accelerated codec that plugs into GStreamer, 
uh, and it works outside of WebKit, uh, there are very high chances that WebKit will also uh, pick it. Uh, and uh, we, uh, WebKit will claim to support any video format and any audio format that it can find a streamer, streamer plugin for. So in, from that point of view, it's not a fixed set of uh, codecs that uh, WebKit would support. We basically ask the streamer, tell me what you can decode. And that's uh, everything that is supported. So if, if there's new uh, video formats uh, or some video format that is not like a standard web format that is uh, supposed to be baseline supported, you can always have extra formats based on what the streamer plugins install. Uh, any other question or comment? Okay, so, oh, yeah, sorry. I guess this is the embedded conference, so I probably shouldn't ask this, but like as far as more like user land Linux desktop software, is, is, are there kind of common apps or like popular apps that use this at, that you know of? In the in the GNOME environment, I mean, pretty much any any application that needs to render web content uses it. Like, uh, if you're familiar with the GNOME uh, evolution, for instance, is the is the mail client. It uses it. Uh, DevHelp is the, the developer documentation client. Also uses it. Uh, Shotwell, I think it does. Uh, uh, I <laughs> pretty much anything that needs to render uh, web content uses it. Uh, I think the well. The matrix uh, client does it use it? I don't know. Nah, I don't know. But pretty much, uh, pretty much any any application that needs to render web content uses it. You know. Back in the day, uh, I would say there were even more. Uh, but it's true that some of them have moved into into other web engines. But that's that's not not. I don't think it's something that is strange from the point of view that in desktop, uh, the resources sometimes are not an issue and you want to have something more similar to a fully fledged browser, in, in which case uh, other options are also reasonable. But in the particular case of embedded, where you need to be very, very careful with the, your uh, memory and storage users, it's a different story, yeah. Sony was uh, showing embedded web ASM stuff. Does Forgive me, I don't know if WebKit supports Web ASM or if that's only Blink or WebAssembly. Ah, yeah, yeah, it does. It does support WebAssembly, yeah. Uh, yeah, but to elaborate a little bit on that, uh, WebAssembly support depends on uh, some architecture-specific code. So, for example, the newest supported architectures like RISC-V uh, that Mario was commenting that is uh, recently it got support in JavaScript core. Right now, it cannot run WebAssembly, but the ARM and x86, they both can run WebAssembly without any kind of issue. Well, what about tools for profiling? Like, oh. use the existing tools, or you guys have any specific tools to help the web developers, let's say, pick the correct uh, frameworks for the web backend that are going to work well on embedded? Yeah, so um, so for, for that, uh, similar to other options, in, in WebKit you have the, 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 the inspector, right? You have a similar inspector to the one that you can see in Chromium, uh, where you can inspect all the code, you can also inspect network requests, you can inspect the JavaScript events, all those kind of things, uh, even how uh, frames are being rendered in different points if you need to go deep down into even how uh, the frame synchronization process, you have all that information through the web inspector. Uh, it's true that uh, that's very useful and very convenient to use when you are on your desktop, but when you are embedded it's different. So that's why we also uh, support a, re a remote way of using the, the inspector. So back in, so before originally, the, in order to be able to use the inspector on a WebKit-based browser uh, on embedded, you needed to use another WebKit-based browser to connect to it. But we have, I think you mentioned it yesterday as well, Adrian, we have implemented a different way, a different way of doing it over HTTP that basically allows you to uh, use the Web Inspector from any browser. 
uh, you, you don't have to have to use uh, Epiphany in the case of Linux or Safari or whatever. But yeah, you have a, if you're familiar with the with the um, uh, Chrome, de Chrome developer tools, uh, it's pretty much similar in the case of WebKit. I would like to add that there's a couple of features from the WebKit Remote Inspector that um, there are similar things also in Chromium for the, um, uh, you can do timeline recordings. Uh, this is the thing you were commenting that you can uh, get an idea of how the rendering process is happening, uh, which parts of the code are taking more or less time, uh, if it's gonna spend time in JavaScript or in painting a frame, etc. cetera. Um, it's, it's a little bit hidden because it's in a tab that is not very prominent in the remote web step inspector, but it's there. And then another one that I have not seen in other browsers is the uh, the layers inspector, uh, because WebKit does this thing that it tries to offload composition of some of the content to the GPU as much as it can. So if you do 3D transforms, for example, they're gonna run in the GPU always. Um, and you can, from this inspector, you can see uh, which parts of your content WebKit has decided to split in separate layers to, um, to, to composite on the GPU. And um, if you are having trouble with animations that run slowly or um, blending operations and so on, you can use some CSS tricks to uh, get them into different layers, uh, like uh, abusing a bit the heuristics that WebKit uses to move objects into, into different layers. And then you can get the benefit of having them composited in the GPU. And, um, and you can also see how much memory uh, is being used in graphics layers and so on, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, which like it tells you exactly which CSS selectors are picked for a layer and uh, which reason uh, there is for promoting that content to a layer. And, and this is a feature that is not very well advertised, I think, and uh, not very well known. And it's it can be quite handy. Yeah, just a quick a quick side note because we have to finish. Um, it's been very useful, for instance, in, in, we've been working on a new SVG engine uh, that, that the current web en the current SVG engine on WebKit uh, unfortunately doesn't allow hardware acceleration because everything goes into a layer. So if you animate SVG, different parts of an SVG, everything has to, <laughs> has to recreate the entire thing again over and over again. And the new engine, what it does is put things in different layers and these layers mm -hmm. are sent to the GPU for compositing, so it's much faster, much smoother. And why I'm saying this, because this thing that Adrian is mentioning in this particular tool is being very usual, very, very uh, uh, useful, sorry, for, for working on that particular feature, because it allows us to, to, to really see how things were being computing in different layers as they should. Any final question? I think we have to finish. Uh, Real quick question. Um, as far as switching from the like custom inspector protocol to HTTP for the remote inspector, what version did that get introduced on? If you, oh, uh, it's been a while already, right? Two thousand forty, I think, a year and a half ago. Two thousand forty, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, uh, so um, we, we just have... one last thing: if somebody's uh, trying to debug media issues, there's also support that comes from GStreamer as well to dump the GStreamer pipelines being used. And we have some documentation now in docswebkit.org about how to get the dump of those and you can generate a graph of the pipelines so you can see which codecs are being used and so on to make sure it's the accelerated version ones. And uh, this will be more like, like a lower level yeah. <laughs> answer, but I know JavaScript core has also some uh, features that you can uh, like inspect uh, dump the generated code by the just-in-time compiler, but I have not used it much. I know it exists. Yeah. So there's, there's also even more lower level, level debugging features that might be handy. Yeah, if you have more questions, I mean, we're, we're going to still be for an hour in the booth, in the booth area in E28. So just, or feel free to send us a mail. Uh, we have to leave now because the next speaker, we are a bit late. Sorry about that. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>